Well, hello there. Welcome back to another Eye Care for Your Brain with board certified neuropsychologist, Dr. Karen Sullivan. Tonight we are talking about brain fog. I'm going to give you the six most well-researched causes, and maybe more importantly, the sixth most evidence-based recommendation. So what is brain fog? It is actually a symptom of something else that is going on. It's an umbrella term for a group of heterogeneous experiences that have several roots psychological overwhelm, inflammation, metabolic dysfunction, nutrition, and sleep are what we're gonna focus on today. The experience has a spectrum, so we can go from mental fatigue all the way up to full dissociation, not really being present in the here and now. It's a feeling of the gears grinding, not enough room at the inn, mental mud, cognitively sluggish, fuzzy. Everybody seems to have their own adjectives trying to make meaning of this very subjective experience. We can see it after both extremes of a lot of mental overstimulation, but also times of mental understimulation. It's essentially a clouding of consciousness, which results in limited cognitive function, not necessarily cognitive impairment, but it's almost like a feeling, a temporary inability to get through to the information that you want to sink your teeth into. The term brain fog actually goes back to the 1850s, but really we started to think about it in the 1980s, 1990s, when it became associated with some very specific medical conditions like chemo brain, mommy brain, autoimmune conditions, but really for a long time it was associated with chronic fatigue syndrome. Presently, I'm hearing a lot about it as it relates to long COVID. And in fact, there is a Dr. Brennan, a neuroscientist at Trinity College in Dublin, who said that the best thing to come out of COVID-19 for people with brain fog is that we now have a spotlight on it and the scientific community is paying much more attention to it. So brain fog is a term that means a little something different to every person who's experiencing it. There's actually no diagnostic criteria, which has made it a poorly researched phenomenon until pretty recently. But there is an agreed upon general umbrella definition, which is subjective cognitive phenomenon uh, of perceived dysfunction. So that's kind of a, a long winded way of talking about mental fatigue, slowed thinking, difficulty focusing, confusion, and a haziness in the thought process. But at the core of brain fog is disordered attention. That is really the issue. It's a lack of concentration that leads to the forgetfulness, to the memory complaints. This is not a memory disorder for the vast majority of people. This is a decrease in working memory. This is our ability to hold on to information long enough to act on it, to manipulate it, and to ultimately put it into memory storage. So if we are not able to really focus on the here and now, we can get behind the eight ball of information and not get it all in. So when we go to recall it as a memory, it was never learned in the first place. Brain fog can last for weeks, months, and sometimes even years. The good news is that we have definitely made progress in the scientific community, and that's what this lecture is all about. So I am going to help you understand what we think are the six most common causes and the six most helpful things that science tells us that you can do about it. So let's start with the causes. Well, that's up for debate, and it's probably different for different people. In October 2021, a group of researchers studied one week's worth of Reddit posts about brain fog. They came up with 1,663, and the causes or the attributions of the medical conditions related to brain fog were just all over the map. 50% of them talked about different illnesses, different diseases, most commonly long COVID, depression, autism, autoimmune conditions, the effect of medications, drug use, discontinuation. So most experts believe this is actually right on target, that there's probably a dozen or so different factors that can result in the experience of brain fog. So the the ask of you as someone, if you're experiencing it or cares about someone who's experiencing it, is you are gonna have to go on a personal journey of figuring out which one of these factors most likely relates to you. And the truth of the matter is, it's almost always going to be more than one. It's kind of a perfect storm that has come together to result in this very disabling, it doesn't, 
you know, get as much kind of um, acknowledgement or validation from doctors because it's very subjective and you can't measure it. There's no blood test for it, even though there is one I'm going to tell you about later that might be helpful to infer uh, as it relates to inflammation. But let's summarize what scientists think are the six most common causes. So the first one has been related to the chronic fatigue syndrome, and this is decreased blood flow to the brain. So what we used to think of as CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, we actually think about it a little bit different now. And we think that it is caused by orthostatic intolerance. So orthostatic intolerance is an inability to remain upright without having some pretty strong physiological changes, specifically cardiovascular symptoms. So a decrease in blood pressure, orthostatic hypotension is the most common. And oftentimes this is tied back to something called POTS, postural tachycardia syndrome, when you put these people into brain scanners, about 80% of them have a decreased blood flow in frontal, temporal, parietal, occipital regions, and some subcortical areas, which is basically the whole brain, compared to other people who do not have these syndromes. And in fact, 85% of people with this condition report experiencing cognitive symptoms. And many studies show that the brain fog is actually the most debilitating disability inducing part of having chronic fatigue or POTS. So that is potentially one cause. Number two is related to inflammation. So brain fog can be due to an overactive immune response. So this has met, led many researchers to thinking that inflammation has something to do with it. There is a heightened immune reaction that kind of gums up the neural works, so to speak, and leads to kind of a, a very mild type of brain damage and, and cell damage that interferes with the ability of brain cells to send signals and communicate back and forth to each other. So this is thought to be likely because we know that after someone has any type of viral infection or when someone has an autoimmune condition, they often have this subjective experience of things being hazy mentally or having that brain fog experience. So the immune system can really go into overdrive and when the body, especially in autoimmune conditions, uh, attacks healthy cells, that, that's, that's the essence of what it is, this can trigger a chronic inflammatory response. And that is um, what many people think it's tied back to. Well, not only autoimmune conditions or viral exposure, but also food sensitivities. A lot of people do have gluten sensitivity, but don't necessarily know it. So some of the scientific evidence we have for this is if you track levels of inflammation in the body, they're very highly correlated to higher complaints of brain fog. So specifically within our brain, thinking of neuroinflammation, this can be caused by the constant activation of the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal pathway, which is essentially our fight or flight response. If we're staying in a constant state of activation, at the ready, our immune system is ready to fight anything comes in and go on the attack and get the invader, this is going to lead to a constant state of inflammation. Now, for some people, it is a physical enemy that is being targeted, so a bacteria. Um, but for some of us, it's actually a psychic enemy, which gets us to number three, and this is trauma. And this is what I think is at the heart of brain fog for a lot of people. 90% of people with a trauma history report having brain fog every single day. So trauma is essentially when more is required of you from the environment than you have the capacity to give. It's a very broad definition, but it often comes along with feelings of helplessness, uh, feeling like you're being trapped in some way, either physically being trapped by a situation or also mentally trapped with nowhere to go, no one to trust, no one to give you a safe environment to let you let your guard down. So PTSD, in addition to being a trauma-based disorder that has a lot of anxiety with characteristic symptoms of avoidance, re-experiencing, hypervigilance, negative mood and cognition, also relates to chronic inflammation. This can be kind of like a hardwired state of always being prepared, always being ready to get into that fight or flight response, which means your stress hormones like cortisol are gonna stay very, very high. Even one dose of cortisol given to an animal or a human in a laboratory study lowers the person's attention, their ability to attend to their immediate environment. This can also be due to kind of a 
learned coping skill, which is the conscious ability to remove yourself from an environment. So this can be when a situation was overwhelming, at some point in our development, we had to learn the ability to retreat from reality into ourselves. This can first happen under conscious control, but decades and decades of doing it. What I often see is people coming to me in their 50s and 60s who are saying this is now happening beyond my control and it feels like a cognitive disorder, it feels like a memory problem, but really it's just that we've lost the flexibility of the system and now it doesn't take very much to retreat into that response. And so we, we have limits. There is a, a limit for how much human beings can absorb in terms of maltreatment and uh, neglect and trauma. and and. Trauma is cumulative. So sometimes the thing that winds up pushing you over the edge and makes these coping skills come back with a vengeance and not under your control isn't the worst thing that ever happened to you. Sometimes it's, it just is symbolic of something that happened in the past or it just is like a final straw and, and there's a certain psychic breaking point that people have, which then is our opportunity to more deeply heal. Number four is metabolic deficiency. So we can think about this like uh, blood sugar, we can think about this as hormones, we can think about this like things like thyroid, estrogen, progesterone, but for most people, blood sugar actually has a lot to do with brain fog. So glucose is essential for brain cells to be able to do their job, but we have no ability to store glucose in neurons for anything more than about 10 minutes. So we need a constant supply and for brain cells to opti optimally function, there's a range of glucose that it wants. And when it's too low, there's symptoms. And when it's too high, there's symptoms. So anytime we're outside of this range, we are going to have the subjective experience of not being fully aware and cognizant and being able to concentrate. We also know that this can be nutritional, right? Low levels of iron have been something that is associated with long COVID. This can be hormonal. About 46% of people who came into a clinic saying they had brain fog did have clinically diagnosable hypothyroidism and 10 to 15% of them continued to report those symptoms even when they were optimally treated with levothyroxine. We also know if estrogen or progesterone is too low or too high, this can also lead to cloudy thinking. The fifth one is sleep. Sleep deprivation in all its different flavors contributes to these slow and foggy feelings. Sleep promotes the clearance of waste from brain cells, removing the debris that can hamper neuro signaling. And many things can disrupt continuous sleep. We don't have a set amount of time that is proper sleep for the brain, but most people are gonna require about eight hours. And what we're really looking for is continuous sleep where you can go through all the stages and have completion and graduate to the next level. But many things interrupt that unfolding of the sleep stages. And what happens is if you get to go back to sleep, you have to start at the front of the line. You don't get to go back into the deep sleep that maybe you were in when you woke up. Many things happen in the sleep. Even if we're not in a deep sleep, it's like a super, super stage one sleep. You might not have any idea what's actually getting in the way of sleep. It very commonly can be anxiety. We do a great job of avoiding things during the day, but at night when our head hits the pillow, it's like, gosh, it's so vivid, it's so real, and our coping skills are at their worst because we're tired from the day. Many people have sleep apnea and have no idea that when they get into deep REM sleep, they actually stop breathing and, and have an alarm system go off in their brain, and they're all night long, dozens if not hundreds of times, waking up from that deep restorative sleep. Many, many things can interfere with sleep. It's always a really important thing to look at. And the sixth one is medications. This is something neuropsychologists always take a good look at because many common medications, the way they work is through inhibition by depressing signals in the brain. So when I see a patient, I'm always looking at their medication list if they have complaints of brain fog for benzodiazepines, beta blockers, painkillers, the most common ones that would cause me to pause are gabapentin, Xanax, clonopin, Valium, Ambien, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, and also anti-seizure drugs. So Lamictal, Keppra, Lyrica, Topamax, especially over 100 milligrams, and finally pain medications. I've been seeing a significant increase in patients on morphine recently, and they come in saying they can't think clearly in their memory, stinks, and 
it's related to the drugs. It's not an easy fix though, because chronic pain, guess what? Also can cause brain fog. So it's just a matter of being aware so you can advocate for your very best care. And the final one is antihistamines. This tends to be more of the first generation. So Benadryl, Vistaril, things like Claritin, Zyrtec, they don't have the same risks to cognition, but the early antihistamines really inhibit the action of something called acetylcholine in the brain, which is essential for activation and the ability to learn new information. Now, here's the thing. It might not just be one medication that is the culprit. It can be the cumulative effect of multiple medications. This becomes more of a concern as we get older and older. So if you are over the age of 65 and you take more than five medications, you are at high risk for polypharmacy and medication related cognitive changes. In part, this is because we get prescribed more medications as we get older, but also our liver and our kidneys undergo significant aging and they're not as optimally functioning as they once were. And we also tend to lose muscle mass, which means that the, the medications we're at our core a little bit more dehydrated and they just become more potent. So a lot of times when people are lucky enough to see a geriatrician, they wind up good going down in their milligrams of medications because as we age, we know that they just become more powerful, less becomes more. So now we're gonna transition into the top six evidence-based recommendations that are thought to be cures for brain fog. There is actually not a lot of data. My job is to go through a large amount of scientific information, synthesize it, and repeat it back to you in a way that I think is helpful and understandable. And there's really two strategies that I see in the literature. The first one is a multidisciplinary approach that increases overall wellness. And I'm going to tell you exactly what that is and simultaneously researching and optimally treating any underlying medical conditions that I had talked about at the beginning of the lecture. When people do these two things combined, it can take about three months for people to see improvement. But I definitely think brain fog in the vast majority of people is treatable. It's certainly improvable. So the first one is a great medical workup. You have to do your job of communicating to a receptive, respectful medical provider what's going on with you and detailing your symptoms. And we want them to do a very good laboratory panel for vitamin deficiencies, autoimmune conditions, thyroid issues, other hormone issues, and infection. The thing that you can request that will give us kind of an indirect understanding to answer the inflammation question is a C-reactive protein test, which is nonspecific in a sense, but it will at least give you and your doctor a little bit of objective information to work on. The number two recommendation is exercise. It just comes back time and time again in the very best research studies. And in part, we think this is beneficial because it increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor, AKA brain fertilizer. Exercise also supports the increased blood flow to the brain. It helps repair and enhance the performance of those connections between the cells. So 30 minutes every day for at least five days a week is the recommendation for brain fog. And there seems to be an additional benefit if you do your physical movement in green spaces. I read some really nice research that talked about when you combine being outdoors, uh, with exercise that you actually get a little bit of a boost in addition to just doing exercise alone inside or in a gym. Number three is to really try to improve the quality of your sleep. Like I said before, there's no set amount of hours for us. It's very personal. It probably has something to do with the genetics of something called adenosine in the brain, which is how well efficiently we break down the byproduct of neurons working all day. Um, some of us are slow, clearer outers and others are very, very efficient. We all know those people who swear they get by on four to five hours of sleep. Um, most people though need about eight hours, if not longer. If you feel like your sleep may be one of the culprits, a very, very easy thing to do is request a sleep study from your primary care physician. One night of commitment, either going into a sleep lab or nowadays you can actually do them at home pretty easily, is well worth getting an objective insight into what is actually going on with your stages of sleep, 
I mean, we have so many sleep disorders, sleep apnea being very common. We have restless leg syndrome, there's insomnia, there's REM sleep disorder. Uh, there's so many different things that can go wrong that once we know what the target is, then we're actually able to offer you more personal care. Number four gets back to what I think is at the heart of this for a lot of us is the cumulative impact of trauma and grief and loss. Like I said before, we can spend a lot of time suppressing because we don't have the ability to handle thoughts, memories, emotions, images, anger, guilt, grudges that we don't have the bandwidth to process directly. Uh, and we might not even be aware of how much of our vital cognitive energy is going to keeping these things status quo on the inside. We may not have any room in our brain to process anything else. There is this new concept of mental clutter that I think is very, very helpful as a metaphor for kind of poorly processed, unresolved traumatic life experiences. They build up and they take up space and they are cloaked. We may not really know what they're all about, but they are existing and needing some attention to stay calm. And it takes up very important cognitive real estate. So talking about what's happened to you in a safe place with a trauma-informed therapist can release that energy to open you up to have more space to focus on the here and now. When you do that, your internal world becomes more organized. And that's really at the heart of what I think brain fog is for a lot of us, is a disorganized mental space. So when we become more integrated with our trauma and our current life, we become more organized, less chaotic internally, and we're freed up to actually have more focus. Number five is stabilizing our metabolic health, focusing on blood sugar. So reactive hypoglycemia is a drop in blood sugar that happens about four hours after we eat. And it's very much associated in laboratory studies with confusion and lightheadedness. We also wanna make sure we're really uh, getting our brain vitamins. So all of the B vitamins, when they're even just a little bit low, have been shown to contribute to brain fog and even a little bit, a modest amount of pro-inflammatory foods in our diet and these subtle hormonal changes can also cause the chronic mental fatigue and the brain fog we're talking about. So you wanna to try to move to eating foods in their closest to original form that they come into from nature. Anything that is shelf stable, really try to work on getting that out of your diet. You wanna eat foods that are as fresh as possible and really focusing on gut health because we know the gut and the brain are connected through millions of neurons via the vagus nerve. There is a lot going Going on between your diet and the clarity of your thoughts. Number six is cognitive rehab. This is actually an underutilized treatment option for people with significant cognitive symptoms. So this can be provided by a neuropsychologist, occupational therapist, or a speech and language pathologist. It starts off with an assessment that identifies exactly where the cognitive deficit is happening. And then targeted interventions can go into helping you learn how to compensate, learn how to cope, how to set realistic goals, how to help manage expectations. Many of us may also have a disconnect between what we think is a productive day and what we're actually capable of. Many of us tend to go, 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 go uh, until the point where we actually exhaust ourselves and then we need kind of a catch up period of restoration, which creates this really bad cycle of never being fully present. You're either like hyper-focusing and burning yourself out or you're totally underactivated and you're not able to take anything in. So what we recommend is for every two hours of intense work, you take at least a 20 minute break to do the opposite action. So if you're sitting, we want you up. If you're at a screen, we want you looking at a big vista. If you're stressed, we want you doing some deep breathing. You wanna to try to do the opposite physiological reaction. In closing, I want you to do your part in communicating to your medical team what's going on with you. You are absolutely worth it. The more you know from science-based lectures like this, the more you can go in on an even playing field and advocate for yourself to get the work up and the treatment that you need. Finally, I want to say, please be easy on yourself if this is something that you're going through. This is an extremely 
challenging uh, modern life that we're living. It's a challenging time of year and brain fog requires a lot of self-compassion. We are a society of doers, accomplishers. There is a place for that, but at the end of the day, we are also human beings. You've probably heard that before. Uh, and there really is a time and a place to truly rest. And some of us, we're resisting or unable to get that actual deep rest that we need that is required to be productive. We have to have both. You can't go too long without one or the other without having some cognitive consequences. So I would love to know in the comments what has worked for you. Remember, we are a community of learners and brain health supporters here. So if you have learned something positive that has been beneficial for your brain fog, let me know so I can share it with my patients. This is the very best that I have to offer you as a neuropsychologist, but I am very open to learning from your experiences. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, please do that. We're up to about 80,000 international learners, which is phenomenal. I have been doing this for almost six years now, and I try to get in here once a week and offer you a free, high quality, in-depth, evidence-based brain health lecture. If you appreciate that, just let me know. That, that's the only thanks that we need. Take care, everybody, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Mm -hmm.